Hello, all of my history-loving friends. Welcome to the world of Madame Morbid. I am your guide on any number of historical adventures. Today, we are getting back into the world of Lee Harvey Oswald. This is part two. If you have not seen part one, I recommend going back. It covers his time in the Soviet Union and how he met Marina. When we start today, Marina, Little June, and Lee are back in the United States. They've just gotten off the ship from returning. They get a couple of days in New York City to see the sights. Marina is dumbfounded by everything she sees. She can't believe the storefronts she sees in New York City with so many goods to buy. She asks Lee who is allowed to buy the things in the store and he said anybody. All you need is money. She had never seen Venetian blinds like what they had in their apartment. She didn't know what the H and the C meant on the faucets in the bathroom. They arrange for a flight to get to Fort Worth. Lee's brother, Robert, sends $200 for the cost of getting them to Fort Worth. They arrive in Love Field. Robert and his wife, Veda, pick them up, and they spend a few weeks living with Robert and Veda. Marina had noticed that a lot of people stared at her when she went out. She thought it was because she looked very different from everybody, that she was a foreigner. But it was actually that she kept little June swaddled, and Americans didn't know what that was and had never seen it. And it wasn't until Veda flat out asked her, why isn't your baby in diapers? That she realized there was a difference, that Americans didn't do this and didn't know what it was. So she showed Marina how to diaper a baby. And June started to wear diapers during the day. And they would swaddle her at night to help her sleep in a way she was used to. Veda was also a beautician. She permed Marina's hair and cut it short. And helped her buy clothes that looked more American. Lee asked Marina to start calling him Lee instead of Alka. She would later say that Alka is how she would refer to him when she was thinking of happier times. Their days in Russia had been fairly happy. But once they got to the United States, he got mean. And the first time he ever hit her was in Robert's house. The whole family was having dinner. Oswald had made a, a couple of contacts with some Russian-speaking people who he hoped might be able to help him find work and or speak with Marina, who found herself in a foreign country with a language she didn't speak at all. He contacted a Russian woman named Gally Clark. She was the wife of a Fort Worth attorney, and she was originally from Russia. She knew of Oswald, but did not care for him. She thought of him as a traitor, whether of the United States or of Russia, I'm not sure. But she wasn't very welcoming when he called her. And he told her he was looking for somebody to speak Russian with his wife. And he just didn't feel she was friendly. So when she called back a few days later, after consulting with her husband, and asked him to bring his wife and child over, he was extremely rude to her and turned her down. While they were at the dining table... I guess the subject came up, and Marina was upset, and they started arguing. In Russian, of course. They were arguing, and then suddenly he stopped, and he just said, Smile, and be nice, and let's not let my brother know we're having a fight. Marina said, No, I'm not going to pretend anything. So he called her a dirty name, and she got up and left the table. He followed her to the bedroom. He was shaking with anger. He had a cold pitiless look in his eye that she had never seen before and it frightened her and as quietly as he could he started to hit her he hit her several times in the face and he told her that if she said anything to Robert about him laying hands on her that he would kill her this was an absolute shock to Marina this is the first time he's laid hands on her she goes outside and she takes a short walk and she thinks oh my god what have I done He's all I have. I'm in a foreign country. I can't communicate with anybody. I am completely reliant on him. And I'm trapped here. Why did I ever leave my loving aunt? 
My Aunt Valia, why did I leave her for this? And for the first time, she realizes I'm afraid of him. But she really didn't have a choice. She had June. All she could do was continue to endure it. She went back. He was lying there awake in bed but said nothing to her. And by the next day, it seemed like things had kind of blown over. On June 26th, Lee met with the FBI. He met with them for about two hours, and they asked him a lot of questions, mostly about why he was in Russia to begin with. They wanted to see if he had been approached as a Soviet asset. He said no, of course, and when they asked him why he went, he just said, because I wanted to. And that's pretty much exactly what he told the Soviets as well. They found him cold, arrogant, I won't say uncooperative, but he was very unfriendly. Which later, Agent Fain, who met with him, would say, I think he might have just been scared. At first, you know, he thought it was uh, something else, but fear makes sense. Given how I have read, he handled stress. If you haven't seen the first video, one of the things I mention about Oswald is that he was a pathological liar. I think he literally couldn't help it. He lied about things he didn't have to lie about. Probably one of the biggest lies he told was when Robert asked him how the FBI questioning had gone. He said, oh, it was just fine. But you know what? The FBI wanted to know whether or not I was an agent of the United States. And I said, don't you know? And then he laughed as if he had turned the tables on the FBI. Lee starts looking for work. He has trouble because a lot of the skills he has that he got in the Marine Corps aren't that marketable in Fort Worth. He can speak Russian. He was trained on radar, but he did not have a high school diploma. And he didn't really tell people that he had spent time in Russia if he didn't have to. So that left a big gap in his work history. Marina hated living with Robert and his wife. She didn't like feeling like she was living off somebody else. She didn't feel like she was contributing. She feared that Veda didn't like her. Robert had witnessed that big fight between her and Lee. And then Marguerite, Lee's mom, shows up. She sold her apartment and she's moved to Fort Worth to be with all of her kids. She gets an apartment and she wants Lee, Marina, and little June to move in with her. Lee doesn't want to do this. Lee doesn't like his mom. First of all, Marguerite has always been horrible to all her kids about their wives. She threw a fit about each and every one of them. And that was the main reason Lee had told Marina of why he had such a bad relationship with his mom. He had told Marina she was mean to my sister-in-law when Robert got married. I think he meant Robert. It was one of his brothers. At first, they did end up moving in. He didn't have a job yet, and they were kind of stuck. Marguerite slept on the couch in the living room, and the family took the bedroom. But because Marina wasn't a great housekeeper, Marguerite kind of had to do a lot of the work. She did the cooking, she did the cleaning, and she started to resent it. And eventually, it got into a fight where she was screaming at Marina, and Marina didn't know why because she couldn't understand what she was saying. She did understand one thing Marguerite said, which she told Lee. She screamed at me, you took my son away from me. Marina doesn't know that that is a normal reaction from Marguerite Oswald to the wives of her sons. So this is very upsetting to her. When Lee got home and found out about this, he had a huge fight with his mother. Slamming doors, screaming, yelling, the whole bit. Move out day sounded like it got pretty, pretty uncomfortable. Robert came to help. He came to pick them up and take them to the new home that Lee had found for them on Mercedes Street. This is the first time they're going to be living completely on their own. Marguerite's face was red from crying, had said that she even, after they had loaded everything up, which they didn't take much with them, they had a couple of boxes, maybe a suitcase, she ran after the car for a little ways, and Marina was upset by this, and she said, she's going to have a heart attack. Why are we being so cruel to her? He just made the comment, this isn't the first time we've been through this with her. The house on Mercedes Street, I, I think it was a, a duplex, and it was described by a lot of people as you know, a dump, a hovel. But for Marina, it had cheap furniture, yes, 
but it had furniture, and it had a lot of space. The kind of space that people in Russia just would never get. And it was clean. So as far as she was concerned, it was wonderful. They had only been there about a week when Agent Fane knocked on the door to talk again with Oswald. He apologized for interrupting dinner because Marina was just making dinner. And he had Oswald come out to his car with him. And they spoke for a good long while. Marina was getting angry. She kept heating and reheating and reheating dinner, waiting for him to come back in. And it was a lot the same as it was before. But Oswald wasn't quite as uptight as he had been the first time. First of all, he had found a job. And he was doing pretty well at it. He was very valued as an employee. And he was bringing home about $55 a week. And Agent Fane said he was much more relaxed than he had been the first time he spoke with him. But he still really would not answer the question of why he went to the Soviet Union. He never admits to wanting to defect to anybody. And they can't get him to. And he swears to them that he's not been approached by anybody at the Soviet Union to be an agent for them. And he tells them that if he is approached, he will let them know. But it leaves him very upset. And despite the fact that Agent Fane comes away thinking he is in no way a threat and recommends closing the case, instead Oswald gets more upset about it and he starts st stressing about it and having anxiety. I'm convinced he must have had some sort of anxiety disorder. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But I have suffered from anxiety myself. I usually more took it out on myself rather than other people. He seems to be a person who would just take it out on other people and just be cruel. But after he got his job, Marina said he really chilled out and seemed much less frightened, irritable. He was just easier to live with. Everybody tried to keep the Mercedes Street address a secret, but Marguerite found them anyway. She showed up at the door one day. Marina let her in. She had a bunch of gifts for them, things they would need for the new house, gifts for the baby. But when Lee found out, he was enraged. And he told her, don't you ever open the door for her again. And she kept saying, I can't do that. She's your mother. She has a right to see her grandchild. And as she kept letting Marguerite in, he finally hit her over it. And actually, the beatings at Mercedes Street became a very normal occurrence. Once or twice a week, he was beating her. And family would come by, and she would have a black eye. And none of them did anything about it. Marguerite knew he was beating Marina. Robert knew he was beating Marina. None of them said anything. But Lee had also hit Marguerite when he was a teenager. So this was not a new behavior. And there was a current in society at the time that this was a private matter between family members that others should stay out of. He would always hit Marina with an open hand across the face. And she had been hit in the past by a stepfather. But he always would just hit her once and then stop. Lee didn't do that. He would hit her over and over again. While living at Mercedes Street, Marina tutored a young man named Paul Gregory on speaking Russian. His father, Peter Gregory, was from Russia, but he hadn't been there in 40 years. And so any Russian he spoke would be outdated. The young man was excited to work with somebody who so recently had lived there. That summer of 1962, between June and August, before he went back to school, Paul spent a lot of time in their home. And he observed a lot of things, one of them being the poor treatment of Marina. One time he saw Marina fall. She was holding June, and she fell, and he said Lee had no concern for Marina at all. He grabbed up June, which it's understandable you're going to, to go for your infant child first, but my hope would be that you would care about your wife too, and after you've checked on the baby, that you would check on her. But instead, he just started berating her for harming his baby, as if she didn't have any role in creating the child. The reflections of various people over and over and over, it's, I liked Marina, I didn't like him. And he was so able, and people noticed, he was able to be cordial and he could treat strangers very well. 
but they also could tell there was this negative undercurrent behind the facade. He didn't try to hide his mistreatment of Marina most of the time. There was a pretty robust community of emigres from Russian territories or former Russian territories who had come to the Fort Worth area over the last several decades. There was a big influx in 1950. And all of these people needed help when they would come to the United States. They didn't speak any English. They needed help finding jobs, integrating into society, and just adjusting to life in a new country. Over the years, all of these people had gotten very close and were a close-knit community. A lot of the organizing was done by a man named, and I am going to say this wrong, it's just going to happen. I tried to find somewhere where his name was said out loud and I couldn't find it. George Bowie Bohe. He was described as the leader, but according to him, he just kind of took it over from the person who started it and was more of an organizer. He was aware th this new couple had arrived from the Soviet Union and everybody was very curious to meet this new family. On August 25th, 1962, George met Lee and Marina for the first time at a dinner held at the home of Peter Gregory and his wife, and his son, Paul, was also there. Other people who attended the dinner include Dorothy Lane, Mrs. Anna Meller of Dallas. Her husband couldn't go, so George actually was her escort that night, with her husband's permission, of course. A lot of these people were sizing them up. What are these new people like? Mr. Bowie, I was very excited to talk to Marina because she had lived for a time in St. Petersburg, and that is where he lived before he emigrated in the 1920s. He had these maps of the city from 1710 all the way to 1914. He sat down with Marina, and he was asking her if some of the buildings he knew as a boy were still there. Is the school I went to as a child still there? Is my home where I lived still there? I found his description of, of Oswald pretty interesting, and I actually, just from reading about him, I had kind of come to that conclusion myself. He's never satisfied no matter where he is. Mr. Bowie called him a rebel against society. Meaning, quote, even if it is good, I don't like it. So joining the Marines, quitting, going to the Soviet Union, not liking it and coming back. As soon as he gets to the United States, he's decided, I want to go back to the Soviet Union. Now, by this point, he hasn't told Marina that yet. But the second they started going back on their own, he was already talking about going back to the Soviet Union. And there was only one thing Marina begged him for. And that was, no matter what, don't ever, ever make me go back. George Bowie and Anna Meller began regularly visiting Marina and June and Lee and realized that their home was really atrocious. There was hardly any furniture in it. The refrigerator was always empty. Little June did not have a crib. She was sleeping. For a time, they created a crib out of two chairs facing each other jammed between their bed and the wall. And June did actually fall between the two chairs when they separated at least once. The immigrant community just came together and started helping them with George Bohe as kind of the main force behind it. The women took Marina under their wing. They showed her around the supermarket, how to get around, how it was put together. They Gave her information about running an American household. They noticed that her teeth were in terrible shape. So they arranged for her to get dental care. She had ultimately six teeth extracted and new ones put in. George Bohe paid for all of it. And though they loved helping Marina and little June, no one had a great love for helping Lee. Lee was incredibly ungrateful. He never said thank you, and he actually began to get very jealous, and he started to beat Marina over it. He would say things like, they're just giving you things so you'll get dependent on them. They want to humiliate me. By giving you things, they're drawing attention to the fact that I can't buy it for you. If anyone's going to spoil you, it should be me. Marina 
in the meantime, saw nothing wrong with accepting help. They did bring Junie a crib. Lee accepted that pretty readily, but when they brought a playpen, he threw a fit over that. Part of the disconnect here is things that they thought of as necessities, Lee thought of as luxuries. So why should I feel bad over things people are giving me that we don't actually need? But at the same time, he was a manipulative creep. He announces one day that he's lost his job. He was working for a welding company. He says, I've lost my job. It was seasonal, so they laid me off. And immediately, all of the emigre community is willing to help. Well, you're more likely to find a job in Dallas. Why don't you move there? They furnish all of the money needed to move. So temporarily, one of them is going to take in Junie and Marina while he stays at the Y and looks for a job. They help move them. They do all of this work. What they don't know is Lee had not been fired. Lee went to work the day after telling them this and seeking their help. As soon as he learned, he would get the help. He just didn't show up the day after that. Then a few days later, he sent him a note, forward my paychecks to this address. They've moved to Dallas. He's staying at the Y. He starts to look for work. He's got some time to live without a family, to be on his own. Here's how Anna Meller described him. Quote, he would trample over you in hobnail boots in order to get what he wanted. We're going to stop here for the second episode. Next time, we will talk about their time in Dallas. After that, there's New Orleans. Uh, there's the assassination attempt on Edwin Walker. I'm really not sure how, how many episodes this is going to end up being, but I'm doing it pretty thorough because one of the things I think is missing in this narrative is exactly who Oswald was. And Oswald himself, for me, is the biggest hole in any conspiracy theory. Just because of who he was as a person, I don't see him conspiring with anybody, working with anybody, being trusted by anybody to have any kind of important role of any kind. But we'll see what you think as the series continues. I would love to know what you think. Let me know in the comments. I will see you all next time.